Can we turn this morning to the book of James? I have been uh, moving in this vein now for a little while, and I plan to stay there in, under the context of prosperity, of prospering, of doing well, of succeeding, of overcoming. And people that are deeply religious, they bristle and their, their quills stand out when you start to speak of prosperity because you shouldn't talk about money in the church. Let me tell you, in this church, we are not afraid to talk about money. Well, at least I'm not. <laughs> in this house, we're going to talk about money because it's one of the most everyday used uh, common denominator things of life. It's a tool that we all have to use and engage with. It is not a moral or an immoral thing. What is moral or immoral is the heart of man. Any tool in your hand can become an instrument of righteousness or an instrument of unrighteousness. So we're going to continue to talk about that. People say, Jesus never preached about prosperity. Did he not really? He preached a lot of kingdom, didn't he? And you will notice the idea, the concept, the principle, the, the reality of prosperity is not just a concept. It is the culture of the kingdom. If you are part of the kingdom of God, you should become a part of the culture of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not one of failure. It is not one of being broke. It's, it's not like that at all. God has a lot. When it refers to the glory of God, all of the glory of the earth, all of the glory of the heavens, all the glory of everything belongs to him. Do you know what that word glory, one of the primary uh, definitions of glory is money. I didn't understand that until just a few months ago. I said, what is this? Glory, money. Are you serious? And as I looked at it, it makes sense. All of the things, they belong to him. So he has a lot. He has enough. And if he actually were to want more, he would just make more. Because he can. He is the boss of the kingdom. When the king requires something, he has the means to fulfill it. Not so much in the modern world. When the people want to do something, they just bless you on April 15 and punish you for making money last year. <laughs> Tomorrow's going to be a little bumpy. Ay, ay, ay. It's going to be a little bumpy. But you know what? Whatever. Because I know the God that I serve has extra. He always has extra. People get into despair over money. There's a lot of suicide and there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of anxiety over this thing of money. Money is temporary. Temporary. So why do we get so angst up about it? I'm just saying we're going to talk freely about commerce and about money and about using those things. And we're going to separate the notion that prosperity is only attached to money. Prospering is throughout your life. And one of those areas, we're not even going to look so much at the money aspect of it today, but we're going to look at prospering today in this word. The culture of the kingdom is a culture of prospering. And I need to say this over and over and over to wash that filth, that word of getting the mud off and away to find the gold. That is the truth. Sometimes we need to let the water of the word continually wash over us until something amazing is revealed. And you're like, oh, I had no idea that thing was there. And then when you find it, then you get to go through the fire. And I wish we could erase that chapter, but we can't. When you go through the fire, now you become something useful and valuable to the king. Let's look into James. Chapter 1 says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I don't like that, but it's there. So let us begin to accept what is written and embrace it and build that into the culture of our lives. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The flesh 
likes to sit down, weep, howl, and mourn because life is so hard. I need some support from someone. I need my therapist. Life is too hard. We sing precious songs mm -hmm, about, Lord, you're my everything. All I need is you. You're so wonderful. And yet we often find ourselves leaning into the emotional space of another person to find a touch from someone who might possibly care or listen to what I have to say. Now, I know I'm going to get criticized for this. I love you anyway. I love you more than you know. I love you enough to tell you that you are never going to find your healing and your fullness and your purpose and your value and all that in another person. I don't care how many letters are behind their name, you're not going to find it there. If you want to be healed and if you want to be whole and if you want to be right and good and all that, you're going to have to find this relationship that is deep in the man of Jesus Christ. And he can heal all those things. In the process, I am not opposed to you seeking help through a counselor who is walking with the living God, not just some cracker, somebody who actually hears from the Lord and will point you to him, point you to Jesus. I'm not opposed to that, okay? So just put your stones back down. <laughs> Let me just say this. In this house... In this house, I will not stand for the spirit of division. I will not stand for it. And I'll just tell you uh, what, where this is coming from. A number of people have received letters in this house, and it points out the faults and the former failures of our overseer. There is not one thing in that paper that I did not know and was not fully aware of. There was not one thing that he has not publicly addressed in this house. There is not one item on there that he's been hiding or not repented of or been completely redeemed from by the blood of Jesus. What I have a problem with is not his past. What I have a problem with is somebody highlighting the sins of a former life and not signing your name to it. I hope that if you are hearing this, that you will repent for that act of division. Amen. That kind of stuff is not going to happen in this place. Amen. When somebody is born again, the old is gone and the new has come. I'm not saying be foolish and embrace everything and just turn the reins over to somebody who has not had proven fruit in their life. But when somebody has godly fruit in their life and the kingdom is manifesting and all that is evident and obvious, by all means, I will defend that person. What I will not defend is somebody being a chicken and shooting darts from the bushes and don't let anybody see me or know who I am. That stuff is so cheap. It's not even childish. It's just plain devilish. So we're not doing that here. If you have a problem with something, you're welcome to come talk to this face right here. I don't bite people. I don't bite you. If there's something legitimate and you have a major concern and you're like, do you know about this? Then I provoke you to come and bring those things directly to me. And I will hear you and I will address it. But we are not going to play those chicken style games here. If you have the boldness to print something off, then you should have the boldness to sign your name. If it's worth being said, then put your name to it. Amen, I have ridden that donkey far enough. <laughs> Knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. that You may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This verse causes an allergic reaction in spiritually undeveloped people who are just walking under a religious umbrella. I'll read it again just because it's fun. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That to me sounds like you have everything you need and your hands are full. We are not talking only about money and resources. I'm talking about what do you need in your life? If you need some more mercy, perhaps, in your life. 
For me, oftentimes, as you can tell, there are times I need more grace in my life. <laughs> it's easy for me to be the John the Baptist guy. It is more difficult for me to be that gracious, kind, soft. It's, it's, it's hard for me to be the Pastor Andy guy. <laughs> Andy can whoop you and you don't know it and you feel nice about it. <laughs> Me, I just, it's hard for me. So I just, I just put it where it is and then we let, let Andy run the mop behind me. <laughs> lacking nothing. Whatever you need, whatever you are lacking in your life. Because as humans, we go through seasons where this is obviously lacking. And so you need more. It continues. Oh, hey, what are we doing? And in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Listen to this. Let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. God is not a tight wad. He is not stingy. He is not a miser. He's not sitting on his stockpile of wisdom afraid that if he gives out too much, he might run out. That's not God. The problem is our capacity to understand and to know has been so dramatically reduced from the fall in that garden that we now occupy and use about 3% of our brain up here. Did you know that? The average person uses about 3%. The real bright ones get into maybe four. There are more things I'd like to say on the other side of that. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if it's okay. <laughs> yeah. At least, at, at, please, at least use 3%. At least, if we can. Let's just agree to use as much as we can. But most people use that 3%. I believe we've been so dramatically reduced in our capacity, and the Lord knows that. And so he's not a tightwad, and he's not afraid of us knowing things. And so as we are able, and as we trust him, as you're in a situation and you need wisdom, ask God. Because all wisdom is his. All truth, it's his. If you need it, just ask him. And he will Give it to you. Continue. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Do you know how that is? I, ha I know how that is. When, when you're lacking something and you see it in the word of the okay, this is for me because as a child of God, I am now, I have access to these things. So you ask the Lord sort of like, see if he will give you some. But you don't actually move into that place expecting him to just give it to you. You know what I'm saying? That way, if I'm back here and if I, don't, if I don't put my faith out there too far, then I won't feel or look like such a fool when it doesn't happen. And you want to safeguard yourself and keep your faith kind of hidden and, and under wraps. And let's just see maybe if I can receive something from the Lord. But not actually stepping into and saying, Lord, I know that you have this and I trust you. And I believe the next move that I make is going to be led by you. Are you hearing this? Yeah. There is a difference in, in testing the concept and testing the truth and actually stepping into it. When you are wishy-washy and you're going back and forth between the two, what does he say? For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Ah, when you ask and you don't receive, I think the safe, the safe place to find yourself is right here in this verse. If you're, not, if you're asking and you're not receiving, don't think that you're going to receive if you are going back and forth, driven by doubt. Amen. It's not going to happen. What you want from the Lord, what you know is yours to receive, then step into it and believe it. I'm preaching to myself right now. Sometimes you have to step in and just do it. He's double, a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There's a lot in these few verses. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes away. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And now let me just tell you, the religious crowd 
loves that verse. Because if you pull it out of its place and out of its context, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like it's better to be broke and those rich people are all going to pass away. They will. So will the broke ones. Would you rather pass away rich or pass away broke? But at the end of life, everybody's going to pass away. Rich or poor, you're going to die. Unless the Lord comes first, that would be amazing. At the end of your life, you're taking nothing in either hand with you. The point is, the rich should never put their trust in their riches. It is only money. And the poor should not be so glorified in the fact that they are living more righteously or holy and it's better to be broken in poverty. That is a lie from the devil. It is not better to be broke. I have been there for many years, and I can tell you by experience, it is not better. It's not, it, it, in, any, in any capacity, it's not good. When there are things that you want to do, and you can't because, well, we're broke. There are things that the Lord puts on your heart to go and do. You want to bless someone and you see a need. And you go to your bank and you're like, hey, uh, shoot. Lord, you're going to have to wait. Because my hands are empty. How many great things can you accomplish and do if your hands are empty? None that take money. If the Lord gives you an assignment, how are you going to fulfill it if you don't have things in your hand? Oh, we just have faith? The Lord will, yes, he does. Believe me when I tell you, I'm not, this is not diminishing faith. I'm not diminishing any of those things. The Lord gives you exactly what you need and when you need it. What I'm saying is stewardship and understanding of resources and how this works. When you're walking in a kingdom mindset, you're not acquiring only to make yourself Look good or or increase your own luxuries and all those things. Some of those things are nice, yes, but that is not the purpose of increase. The purpose of increase in the place of the kingdom is so that when the Lord requires something from you, you have enough in your hand to go and do it or support somebody who is. It is for the purpose of eternity. As soon as you lose the, the vision of eternity in resources, you have lost it altogether and you've become very short sighted and carnal if you have if you have a hundred million dollars to your name right now I bless the Lord for you I hope that he increases you to twice that in the next five years unless your heart is corrupt then I hope it diminishes Because money outside of character will destroy you. If you do not have the character to manage, then you should not even want to ask for it. Before you beg God for money, I had to learn this, I'm telling you from experience, I had to learn to ask him for character. And (laughs) if you, that's a dangerous prayer because if you lack character and you ask for it, he will give it to you. (laughs) And acquiring character is not fun and it's not easy. It's expensive and it's very difficult. You do not become capable of those scales of operation overnight by sitting on your sofa. It's hard to build character. I'm telling you at every level, if the the decisions that you make are a reflection of your character, and when you are making temporary decisions just to satisfy what you want in the moment, you are proving to your master that you are not capable of acquiring more or handling more. I used to pray to him so hard, Lord, we're broke. I have these bills to pay, blah, 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 and all this stuff. And then he would bail me out. I'm like, oh, thank you. Just how amazing. In the the nick of time, like you were hanging over the edge and then you know you're going to die. And then he somehow is like, no, I got you. Like, oh, what a relief. In the early days, it was like 500 bucks or something. And you just stress out because it might as well be a million, 500 or a million. What difference does it make if you don't have it? You don't have it. And you know that you're going to have major problems. And then he delivers you. 
and then you move on in your life, and then the next one is 5,000, and you're just like, okay, we're, we're done. Like, my life is over. And again, he somehow delivers you. And the next one is a 50,000, and you're like, oh, there's no, I could recover this one. Let me, let me learn this lesson again, because I can manage this one now. This one is different. And it continues to build and to build and to build and to build until now my problems are way more than I ever thought they would be. And I'm going, hmm. Do you stop growing and play it safe? I'll tell you, it would be much easier for me to chill out in my life and arrange some things and just live a nice life and stay safe. It would sort of feel good for a little bit, but I know there's more things in me that need to come out and need to be developed and need to happen. And so for me to sit still, I will go crazy in that place if I do it too long because I know that he has called me to do and to start things. So in spite of the fear that comes against me, I have to grow up and say, okay, Lord, whatever I'm lacking for this next thing, bring it to me because I know I'm going to need it. And so whatever training that requires, whatever teaching that, whatever growth, whatever stuff I have to get out of my life to make room for whatever is coming that's new, do those deep things in me. And it's a dangerous prayer to pray because things in your life get rearranged and stuff sometimes disappears that you thought was so precious. But I provoke you with this. Is he actually the Lord of all of your life or just a portion? The Lord of the Western Church, by observation, is not actually Lord. He's about a 50% co-Lord. We give him permission to do a few things. And we grant him access to do, you know, whatever is safe and we can sort of contain. And then whatever is beyond that, I, I'll take the wheel back. Lord, thank you, because you obviously don't quite have it figured out. And then we wonder why there are more problems. It is when we get in the way of him actually being Lord that we have problems. This so applies to our money. Who creates the financial problems in your life? <laughs> One honest person in the room. It isn't Amazon. They're just a facilitator of your brokenness. It's true. Scamazon, whatever. <clears throat> Let the lowly glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation who passes away. Da, 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 da. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. When does that happen? When he has been approved. When are you approved? At the point of salvation, I believe, is when you are secured in your position to receive this. The fulfillment of it, I believe, comes incrementally throughout your life. Whatever season you are in now, that is not your final season. There is more coming. If you are in your last season here on the earth, there is another season coming. Nothing here will be completely fulfilled. Your fulfillment and all of the, the true fullness of it comes when you step out of this into the next. In the process, though, there are incremental fulfillments of these things coming to pass in your life. We don't stay the same. So if you're an infant, you come to the Lord and you know nothing, nobody's taught you anything about management or anything, and you're flat broke, God has so much grace for you. He did for me, and I know he didn't run out. If you will apply yourself, pursue wisdom, and in all you're getting, 
get understanding. If you do not have wisdom and understanding, you will not know how to manage. If you don't know how to manage, you'll put yourself in bad shape. If you put yourself in bad shape, it is your own problem and your own fault. And if you sit there and pity yourself, you can look at your future. This is no lie. At one season of our life, I was so broken as a person in understanding, and I got myself into problems doing business with a first cousin to the devil. And it's not good. <laughs> Stay away from those people. Stay away from them. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving financial counsel or guidance or advice. I'm just telling you from my perspective. Stay away from the first cousin of the devil. Because he will promise you great things and he will clean you out and leave you wondering how over the next 40 years of your life you will ever get to zero. Be careful who you do business with. If you yoke yourself with the devil, you are going to get his results. I didn't know any better. That's, see, that's not completely true. Something in me said, ah, this is off. I should not be doing this. But the other side of me, that greedy part that was not redeemed yet, said, ah, this is actually going to work. We're going to make millions. It's going to be amazing. Yes, let's do this. Let's not just tiptoe in. Let's dive in. Dive in. And I was the one that brought the money, and he brought the stupidity, and it all went down the toilet. <laughs> I think he still has his portion, though. <laughs> Regardless, a lot of what I'm giving you cost me dearly. It cost me big time to learn the things that I've learned, to get the understanding I've gotten, to develop the character that the Lord has given me it is painful and expensive. It has been years and years and years. So what I'm releasing to you, I do it from a place of passion because I know that it's true. And if God can take a broken wretch who I was, he did not first give me the resources. He first gave me opportunity to humble myself and to ask him for character. And when that process began, he is faithful to give you character. And then the resources find you, and you're like, thank you. I didn't even have to go and strive for this. It literally is a thing of when you walk closely with the Lord and you are actually pursuing his kingdom, this word is so true. The resources are like a byproduct of your surrendering yourself and walking in humility with him. If you pursue resources just with your skills and whatever, you can go and get some. A lot of people do that. But if you are pursuing the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Now, would you rather work for your righteousness and work for your resources and work for all your things the way that many systems and religions teach is the right way to do it? Just work harder. Yeah, well, you can, or you can seek the kingdom and listen, God is not some lottery machine. He's, he's not that at all. I, I will never, you will not hear me say that. He is just and he is faithful and he is true. And the principles that he gives us as his children, he gives them because they work. And when you just do that, it works. And then you're like, well, thank you. I didn't know it was that easy. Just thank you. Now, before you think that life is easy and all of a sudden you say a few right words, your life, that's not the truth completely, but it is much easier than striving in the flesh to do it all yourself. Much easier. Sometimes more dangerous because there are times when you're finally, finally you've been digging out of your hole, dig, 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 and the more you dig, it's like the hole gets deeper instead of filled up, and you're finally, you think, maybe I can see daylight out there, maybe. Maybe. And then the Lord asks something completely ridiculous of you to test you. And now what? Is he the Lord or is he just a good idea for now? If he is the Lord and he asks you, hey, I, I need, I, the Lord does not need anything from me. If he wants me to position some of my resources somewhere else because somebody else is in need of them, what do you do? 
I can tell you money, this is the reason most churches don't talk about this stuff because money is the biggest test of your character. It is the biggest statement about who you are. We become so attached to our money. We just can't have enough. The, the factor, the element of living the dream and the idea of just we're all going to be loaded and one day have a life of ease, that has driven more people to poverty and to slavery than anything. We're not promised a life of ease and you're not promised all that stuff. What I am telling you though freely is when you walk with the Lord and you walk in his character and you pursue the kingdom, the other stuff, the lower level things like money, it shows up. And now you just have to manage those things. The harder thing, harder than managing money is to manage your tongue. He who controls his tongue is stronger than one who takes a city. If you think you're going to grow wealthy and all those things and you cannot control your tongue, you are deceiving yourself. Amen. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Catch this last part. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not bring you temptation. There is one who opposes you. There's one who wants to see you fall. There's one who wants to take you out and destroy you. It is not God. Never should we put God's name on something of that nature. He's not tempting you. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. This is going to hurt. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. I don't appreciate that verse at all. Do you know why? Because I have nowhere to go with any excuse. I can't blame any of the weakness or the, the brokenness that is still trying to claim. I can't ascribe any kind of an excuse. Let's read it again. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The things that you're drawn to, if you don't like what you're being drawn to, they're in there. You're not the victim. I would like to say I'm the victim of marketing. I just couldn't help it. I didn't know I needed this whatever, whatever, until it came along my news feed, and hey, look at that, click. It's on the truck headed my way. Victim. No, I'm not a victim. There is something broken in here in the desires department that is causing these problems. It is the lack of contentment. I know this message is not comfortable. Godliness coupled with contentment is great gain. If you are godly without contentment, forget your gain. You are not going to be content without godliness, so forget even using that side of the argument. Godliness along with contentment is great gain. Not a little gain, not a decent gain, not a mediocre gain, or an average gain. It is great gain. If you will find yourself perfectly content with where you are in life, what you are doing in life, who you are as a person in life, and bring all of your high ambitions to the cross and say, Lord, I am giving you all that is me. I just want to be effective for you. I want to be like you. How can you change me to be more like you? Allow him to satisfy you with who he is. When you actually become content, again, I'm telling you from experience, contentment's not just a word, it's a, it's a reality. When you become content and you are truly seeking the kingdom, all these things will be added to you. The only person there is ever to blame for lack and whatever is to look into the mirror. That person is your biggest problem. 
but you don't know my spouse. <laughs> hey, why don't you deal with you? And then we ask the Lord to deal with him or her. I know some of you need to cool off the Amazon button. It's caused contention in your marriages. And then you wonder why my husband's just, <laughs> now I'm going to preach. When you intentionally do things that you know cause strife in your marriage and your partner gets angry at you and then you're like, well, see, they're the problem. They just can't control their anger. They just, ah, you need to go to a conference and get delivered for your anger. No, actually, actually and factually. <laughs> the weakness is back here in your inability to be satisfied and to be content. And when you keep click, click, clicking and causing these, pro you know the result is going to be a problem. And you do it anyway. You are sowing into your hurricane. You are inviting bad weather into your environment. Yeah. You want to open the door and give the devil some access in your home? Do something stupid that you know you should not be doing. And then wait. Sure enough, he shows up with the box with the big smile on it. There he comes right in the door with it. I'm speaking truth. <laughs> then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Everything that we know that is good is from the Lord. If it is genuinely good, it comes from God. The devil can never give you anything actually good. He can give you some counterfeit garbage. He can give you some temporary whatevers, but he can never give you anything that is actually good long-term. He's a thief and a liar, and we need to expose him as the, the schmuck that he is. He is useless. Of his own will, I'm now switching and I'm talking not about the devil anymore, I'm talking about the Lord. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I'm not going to get into first fruits today, but that is another subject that ties into this whole thing of giving, of tithing. This is not an offering Sunday, so just calm down. The point of all of this teaching that I'm doing is not to raise money for this house. Okay, the Lord knows how much we need, and he, he gives it. He does. From day number one, this house has not been broke. We have never gone into debt other than to take on the debt on this property when we bought it, and the Lord paid that off too. He gives us what we need when we need it. And he has been faithful. He does not change, so I expect he will be faithful. I am not worried. I'm not trying to clean you out and wring you dry. I'm not that kind of a guy. I want you, though, to experience, to begin to test God in this not in any other area do I find where it's okay to test God, but he invites us to test him in resources. Try me in this and see. I'm provoking you to get into this word of God yourself. Feed yourself and discover this for yourself. We're going to teach a few things, but I can never teach you everything you need to know. Try me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't. He only ever says that about money. Get to know your word. That is not for today. However, the principle of fruist, fruist, first fruits, get the buggy behind the horse. The principle of the first fruits remains through your life. If you are seeking kingdom and walking with him, I'm telling you by experience and by the word of God, when you honor God with your first fruits, not whatever is remaining and hope there's a little bit of something left over for him, but you intentionally give him the best that you have, yes. you will find your life increasing, yes. the value of your life increasing. You will find, let me just tell you, this is not in my message. I didn't even plan any of this. I haven't thought of it, but I'll just tell you the truth. I am very aware that in this season of my life, God has given me the best things on the face of the earth. And what do I mean? 
I mean this. What my life was and what I knew before was constantly living in a state or a season of anxiety when your equipment is junk and you're afraid all the time something's gonna break and it'll wipe you out, there's always that risk and all those things. When your vehicles are trash and you're, you're always just wondering, is this thing gonna make it to next year? What are we doing? When you're in that hamster wheel of anxiety and stress, it seems like that wheel will never stop. In that season, you didn't find this guy eating Wagyu. You eat as cheap as you can to save a few extra bucks so that you can hopefully have a tiny bit left for an emergency because they do come along sometimes. So I was not splurgy. You go out to dinner once in a blue moon, you get water with lemon, unless the lemon costs you, then you only get water. <laughs> and you don't get appetizer, and you get whatever is economical, and then you don't get dessert. That is how I lived for many, many many, many years. We didn't have paid subscription TV service. Everything was reduced down to where it was bare bones. And many times you feel like you're living kind of like a rat. I know those days. But the Lord has done things and he has dramatically brought good things into my life. I know where to find the best food in this region. I do. It's a good food is a gift from the Lord. It's not just something that you should plow into your mouth and get on with your day. You should enjoy every bite of your meal and give thanks to God for good food. It's for us to enjoy. Did you know that in heaven they're enjoying food? They're not just shoveling in the cheap mashed potatoes. They're enjoying it. And there's fellowship. And there's an environment of community there. There is something about good food. Those of you that know how to make amazing food, I bless you and I bless you and I bless you. It is, it is, the, it is the culture of the kingdom to raise your standard as high as you can raise it. When I find something better than what I have now, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I didn't know it's even possible. Did you know this? You can take a, a head of broccoli of all despicable vegetables that you, you gagged over as a child. A head of broccoli, if it's treated properly, can be absolutely amazing. If you're just shoveling your hole full and it's quickly off to the next thing, you're not going to discover how to fix this little head to enjoy it. But when we calm ourselves down and you just walk with the Lord, he lets you in on secrets. And the next thing you know, you're like, hey, if I smoke this piece of meat this way, oh, hallelujah. That is something that if Jesus was at my table, I would be pleased to serve him. And then I would ask him, is there any way I could make it even better? Because I don't know. Like, I want to make it as good as I can make it for you. And now when you are hosting people and having other people in your home, are you going to be a tight wad? And we... Or are you going to serve them as if Jesus was there and you take your time and you do it very well? I'm telling you, the standard, the standard that you set for your home, the environment that you set for your home will attract results. I'm not saying live above your means by any, by any stretch. Live within your means. But when you have opportunity, raise your own bar and push yourself to be better and to be excellent. A lot of times it doesn't cost you that much more to be excellent. But ask the Lord. In everything that you're doing, ask the Lord, how can I make this better? How can I improve this? How can I be more efficient at this? Is there a way to, to improve? And he will show you. It is all part of culture. It's all part of building an environment. And I'm telling you, the way that you think is the, the, those things you're going to attract. If you only think cheap and easy, that's going to be the format of your life. You're going to cheap and easy. 
But if you will set your mind on excellence and model what is in heaven and bring those concepts here and release them, you are going to invite and you're going to attract those good things that come from above. If you want good things in your life, invite the environment of heaven to your table. Invite the environment of heaven into your bank account. Before you get crazy with that, invite the nature and the character of God into yourself. Because without that, the other stuff is not really that great. I want for every person. Do you know what I think oftentimes when I, when I bite into a Wagyu burger that is dripping with its own goodness and not doctored up with artificial things, I think to myself how I wish everyone on the earth could enjoy this. I wish they could just enjoy this. In India, they cannot enjoy that. Their, <laughs> their religion prohibits them from enjoying what I enjoy here. Yeah. Shall I get personal and name things close to home or shall I stay safe and let's go move on from here? Safe. safe. <laughs> Do you know how many things God intended for our good and he blessed us with them. And because of some nonsensical, corrupt mindset, we deny ourselves things that God intended for our good. Amen. We do. And then we call it righteousness. Oh, if I will just deny myself. Now I'm righteous. No, you're not. You're just lame. <laughs> you just, you're not enjoying the fullness of the goodness of God. I'm not saying this gives you license to indulge and do sinful things. Never, never. But I'm saying enjoying the goodness of the fruit of the earth, God gave those for us. Enjoy them. Unless you want to be religious, then live your little life. So then, 19, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Is that an amen verse in the Bible or what? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It never has and it never will. It's, on one hand it's sad, but on the other hand it's kind of funny. When you, <laughs> when you see somebody just ticked off, the sad thing is they really don't understand who they are, who they could be. And their idea of themselves is usually way bigger than, than what they are as a person. And so they, when they feel violated or offended, like you, you cut off some guy. My, no, it's dangerous. My, this is sometimes I just laugh at people. It's just funny. Because you take yourself so seriously and you think you're some big entity and now you have been violated. Somebody cut you off and it cost you less than a tenth of a second. And mm, because you're in my space, I'm going to prove you wrong. And when that wrath comes out and all this anger and all this turmoil and all this stuff is going on, it's like, what, what are you even doing? Like you've created all of this angst in the world and you're not accomplishing anything good. You're just a big turmoil, a big ball of barbed wire raging around in your little car. The mouth is going and the fingers are flying. And you're like, look at this guy. What are you going to do actually? Like, what, what are you going to do? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, ever. If you want to be trusted with great resources, you are going to have to figure out how to condition yourself to not be the little rage warrior like this guy. If you want to live that way, do not plan on God giving you great resources to function with because likely you will use them for your detriment. If your heart is messed up and broken, anything in your hand you will use for those purposes. If your heart is truly righteous and good, 
anything in your hand you will use for those purposes. Swift to hear, very, very slow to speak. Do you know how hard that is? When I was much younger, I was very swift to speak and I could not hear. And the, I, I feel sorry for the people that were in that season of my life. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And many of them, when they found out that I became a minister, they were like, what? It's like, I know, I know, I'm more surprised than you are, okay? Let's just put it that way. When your mouth outruns your brain, you set the table for problems. And when your mouth outruns your character, and your character is already messed up, you set your environment for many problems. And I went through a number of years of the Lord pinching this thing shut. And some of you are thinking I should do it again because it's time for lunch. <laughs> I had to learn how to close this. Even when I had great things to say, he just kept telling me, you be quiet. That was a painful season, but you know what it produced? Character. Because you can weigh a situation before you speak ignorance. To be the first one out with the bombshell report, that's what everybody wants. The latest now word coming to you live. Yep. Sit down. Give this some time. Talk with the Lord. And when you have a response that is mixed with the grace of God and some, hopefully some wisdom, speak your words. This will save you a lot of grief. Young people, don't wait like I did until you were an old guy to figure this stuff out. Guard your mouth and guard it very well. It will put you on the fast track to developing your culture and developing your future. Therefore, therefore, let us get through chapter one and I promise you we'll get out of here. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is a big deception in popular church culture. We go and we get our ears tickled and it feels nice and we have a nice coffee. And off we go and you completely forget every word that was ever spoken. But it sure felt nice in the moment. Don't deceive yourself. You, if that is you, you are deceiving yourself. Yes, come to church and get your coffee, and hopefully we have a half-decent message, and you are provoked and stimulated in your walk with God, but if it stops there, then we're all failing. The point of me being here is to provoke you into a deeper, intimate walk with the living God. It's not just about these couple-hour deals. You have to walk with him yourself. If all we're doing is the surfacey stuff, you are just deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving me or the person next to you, you deceive yourself. That is a terrible idea. It's one thing to be deceived by another, that's bad. But when you deceive yourself, it's another level. I'm saying be aware of this. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was as he walks into Walmart. <laughs> some people pay too little attention to their appearance, and some people pay far too much. Oftentimes, oh, this is fun. Oftentimes, those who pay too much attention to their outward appearance end up paying far too little time to their inward appearance. I'm not suggesting that ugliness is godliness. You will not hear me say that. In fact, heaven is filled with beauty. It's beautiful. We should reveal in whatever capacity we can 
the culture of heaven. Not for vain conceit and all that nonsense. But believers should be attractive people inside and outside. Here we go. If you've not heard anything else, listen to this verse and then we're going to be finished. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, it's one thing to take a glance. It is another to stay there and examine and stay there and dig and stay there and continue to dig. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If blessing and if success and if prospering is not a heavenly or a godly or a kingdom thing, why would he promise it to those in this context? I propose to you, blessing is primarily for God's children. It is. It is the heart of God to bless his sons and daughters. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Do you want to be blessed? Let me ask you that. Do you want to, you actually want to be blessed? Some people are afraid of being blessed because it means they will not be able to live how they were living before in that pity party smear of whatever. Some people actually enjoy the attention they get there. If you want to be blessed, then do this. Look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it. And don't be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. You will be blessed. It's pretty simple. It's difficult, but it's pretty simple. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives again his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm not against religion. I'm against bad religion. The good kind is just fine with me. The problem is most of our experiences have been tainted from broken religious hierarchies and they have pitted our thoughts against what is actually true. I will hammer this point and I will continue to hammer it hopefully as long as I live. Every good and perfect gift is from God. He sends it to us on purpose because he is good and he wants us to enjoy good things. At the same time, as those of you with kids have expectations of your children, you want to see them develop and grow, and then we move to the next level, and you develop and grow. It would be an unwise parent to grant your children everything they want, because they would destroy themselves. If God gave you, you see, I had to go back numerous times when finally revelation came to this guy, finally I got the picture and the Lord turned the lights on and he said, remember when you were asking for all this stuff back here? If I would have given you that, it would have completely destroyed you. Yeah. Yep. You know, at that point, all I can do is say thank you for not giving me the desires of a broken and messed up heart. Thank you for not trusting me with that messed up character at the time. I see now I would have been a complete fool and ruined not only my own life, but many other people's. It was the right thing to do for you to deny me my foolish request. If God is not moving and answering the way that you want him to right now in your life, I would challenge you with this. I'm not saying thus says the Lord, and I'm not saying this is absolute. I'm saying consider I know we like to think we're perfect, but consider if maybe the thing that you want in itself is not the wrong thing, it's not a bad thing, but the timing is not yet there for you to responsibly handle it or for you to effectively use it. 
Maybe trust the Lord with timing. If you actually trust him, there's this thing of contentment that can seat down inside of you when I'm fully convinced that God is my father and he is good. Everything that he wants for me, he wants the best for me. He does. When I know that and I know that I know that. And I can trust him with the timing. I can trust him with the provision. I trust him with everything. I'm telling you, your world changes. It does. It's not overnight. It's years. But when you, when you change the way you think, you will change the way you live. And when you change the way you live, you will get different results. It's part of maturity. It's part of growing. It's part of going deeper in understanding with the Lord. Can we stand? I, I hope that these things are beneficial to you. If it's from the word of God and you allow it in, I know it will be. I, I don't want to ever project like I have all of the answers unless they come from the written word. But I do want to let you know that when I have discovered a truth and I have walked in it and I know the results of it, I want everyone to be able to taste that and to have it. God is not a respecter of persons. The thing that you find yourself lacking, ask him in faith. Lord, this morning, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you don't change. That what you have spoken, you have spoken. I ask you, Lord, for the culture in this house and for your people around the world to reflect the culture of heaven. I ask you for the deep things of character to be primarily what we pursue. The deep things that are on your heart, the things that you want to release, that those are the things we walk in and pursue. I ask you, Lord, for depth in our understanding. Lord, I pray that this word will remain and that none of the seeds that go, have gone into the ground this morning will be stolen. I pray that they will grow and bring you great, great harvest. That our lives can bring you glory, Lord, in ways that we have not yet imagined. Increase yourself in us, Lord, that we can bring you a full measure of the glory that belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen.